French video game publisher Ubisoft are known for their open-world, action-packed stealth titles that feature giant maps, climbable towers, and vast amounts of collectibles. But no franchise has quite propelled them into stardom the same way that Assassin's Creed has. The series has been incredibly successful, selling over 200 million copies across the globe, with 12 main entries to its name, 14 spin-offs, several art books, novels, comics, and even a live-action movie starring Michael Fassbender released in 2016. The IP has become something of a phenomenon over the last 15 years or so. But before it reinvented itself as an RPG, before it crossed over with Final Fantasy, before it garnered negative attention for its yearly cycle of rinse repeating the same formula, there was a single game that stood on its own. Released in 2007, what could possibly be considered the most competitive year in gaming history was the original Assassin's Creed. What initially started development as just another Prince of Persia title quickly developed into its own game set in the Third Crusade about a small clan of assassins and their war against a faction known as the Templars. Obviously, the thing was successful, but a surprising amount of people haven't played this one, likely because it's the only game in the series you can't play on current hardware. The Ezio Collection, along with Assassin's Creed 3, have been remastered, and the later titles are available on PS5 and Xbox Series X through backwards compatibility, but the original game was never given the same treatment. The only way to play it now is to buy it on Steam, if you're a PC player, or to dig out your Xbox 360 or PS3 and play an original disc copy like I did. So for the sake of informing anyone who's had this game pass them by over the years, and to entertain a sense of nostalgia from my eight-year-old self, let's take a look at the original Assassin's Creed. The year is 1191, and Altair ibn al-Ahad, a senior member of the Assassin Brotherhood, has been sent on a mission to retrieve an important artifact from the Templars. However, due to his arrogance and impatience, he fails to retrieve the artifact which results in one of his fellow Assassins dying on the mission, and another being dismembered. Upon returning to the assassin home base of Masayaf, Altair's mentor and superior Al Mualim demotes him down to the rank of novice and strips him of his gear. In order to regain his previous position and honor, Altair must assassinate nine specific individuals across the kingdom. So, Al Mualim orders an assassination, and Altair rides across the Holy Land to one of three cities Acre, Damascus, or Jerusalem to find the Brotherhood agent in that city. They reside in abandoned buildings that can be used as safe houses, where they give you some basic information on your current target. In order to get any real, useful information though, you have to do a series of investigative missions which include pickpocketing, eavesdropping, interrogating, and general tasks for other assassins. Once you have enough to go on, you can begin planning how you're going to take out your target, and once he's dead, we go back to Masayaf and tell Al Mulim the news. He restores our rank and equipment one by one, and gives us our next mission. That's pretty much the setup for the game. The gameplay loop is pretty much receive a target, go to the respective city, do the reconnaissance missions, kill the target, and come home. There are other things to do in the city to make your life a little easier, like helping out civilians being harassed by guards, who will then repay the favour by distracting them while you're being chased down. There's also the staple of climbing to the peak of a high tower in order to map out the city and the missions available within it. And this is pretty much it, that's the game. Until you discover that Assassin's Creed is actually a sci-fi story. As well as playing as Altair in the Third Crusade, we also take control of Desmond Miles in the year 2012. Just a side note, this was set 5 years after the game's release, which is now 11 years in the past. So, good luck dealing with that existential crisis. Anyway, this was kind of a big deal at release. Granted, no one is playing this game in 2023 and doesn't know that there are two timelines going on, but this was a big rug pull for me back in 2007. So Desmond is a bartender who wakes up in Abstergo headquarters in Rome. Abstergo is the world's largest pharmaceutical conglomerate, where have I heard that before, who have kidnapped Desmond and are forcing him to participate in trials related to the Animus Project. 
Monitored by Dr. Warren Vidic and his assistant Lucy, the Animus project involves the use of a machine, called the Animus, that is capable of translating genetic memories of a subject's ancestors into a simulated reality. For some mysterious reason, Abstergo wants a piece of information locked away by the assassins, so they're trying to access it through the memories of Altair, Desmond's ancestor. And for the rest of the game, we switch periodically from Altair and his crusade to kill his nine targets, and Desmond who spends his days locked away in a secret research facility by a shady organisation. The first Assassin's Creed gets a lot of flack for being a tad repetitive and constantly recycling assets to pad out its runtime. Now, there is an argument to be made for this, the random dialogue from civilians is a prime example, however, what I found to be interesting was the way that the developers went around trying to hide these anomalies. Despite a few artistic flourishes here and there, the three main cities of the game are practically identical. The layout is different, but the models for the buildings, landmark positions and general aesthetic are pretty much the same. But what Ubisoft did to disguise this was give each city its own coloured filter to give it its own sense of character. For example, Accra has a blue tone that communicates the sad, poor lifestyle of its inhabitants where dead bodies line the streets. Since it sits next to the Mediterranean Sea, the air is misty and shrouded in fog where Damascus, which is renowned for its forged steel, is highlighted in a gold aura that represents the general cleanliness and wealth of its population. That's all it is, a filter. But it does wonders for subconsciously communicating information to the player without long-winded dialogue or exposition. So the assassin's home base is Masayaf, located on an isolated mountain in western Syria. From here, you can explore the nearby town, although there isn't much to do, and get on horseback to travel across the kingdom, which itself connects to the other three cities. The kingdom itself is a bit of a no man's land where anyone and everyone is out for themselves and will attack you on sight. Again, similar to Masayaf, there isn't much reason to stick around here, so you'll likely spend your time galloping past everybody and listening to the alert sound beeping non-stop. The overall world though of the original Assassin's Creed is a mixed bag. It's effectively desolate and its drab washed out colour palette does a good job of immersing you into the Third Crusade. However, the lack of variety in the cities and the complete absence of anything worthwhile to do in the kingdom makes for a game where you spend half of your time trying to rush through it to get to the next section. Luckily, after a while you do unlock fast travel so you can easily return to cities that you've previously visited, but you still have to endure that repetitive slog in the first few hours. The futuristic sections of the game are actually pretty engaging to me. I've heard that a lot of people think that this futuristic sci-fi part is the weakest section of the game, but I can actually appreciate the, the cool mystery that they've set up here. Granted, it's hardly entertaining from a gameplay perspective, since all you do is walk around and occasionally interact with things in two different rooms, but the development of the story is what truly shines here. It slowly unfolds and gives you little pieces at a time so that you can try to understand what's going on by your own merit. Once you get so far into the game, a mysterious stranger leaves you the access code to leave your room at night once everybody has left the building. From here, you can access the computer terminals in the lab and read through Lucy and Warren's emails to learn more about them and Abstergo. You learn that you are being referred to as Patient 17, with something sinister having happened to the previous 16, including a bleeding effect, which is essentially a blending of genetic and real-time memory. This is all really interesting stuff. Yes, Desmond is a bit dull as a protagonist, but the setup is truly interesting and unique. The Animus itself does a lot of the heavy lifting here. It's a relentlessly intriguing concept. Imagine being able to not only see, but puppet an artificial recreation of one of your ancestors and literally walk in their shoes for a while. Not only is the Animus an, an integral plot device, but it actually contextualizes a lot of the game's mechanics and drawbacks. People always used to make fun of games like Vice City because Tommy Vassetti couldn't swim and would instantly sink the moment he came into contact with water. The same applies here in Assassin's Creed, but it's seen as a limitation of the animus. The technology just isn't there yet to authentically recreate swimming as an option. The animus can actually be used to bat away quite a lot of the game's technical hindrances. 
You can't go wherever you like from the get-go. Certain areas are walled off in a glitchy haze because Altair didn't go there yet. The same applies when you fail a mission objective. The typical video game mechanic of you lose, try again is the anima saying, hold on, this isn't what happened. In this first game, you don't even have a health gauge. You have a synchronization bar which has to be maintained, otherwise the animus will effectively boot the user out of the memory for straying too far from actual events. Altair canonically never took damage in combat, and so every time you get hit, that synchronization bar will begin to tick down. The animus is an incredible piece of tech when you consider its capabilities, but it's not a perfect machine. So its limitations do a fantastic job of lending some diegesis to the world of Assassin's Creed. What many would consider accidental faults on the developer's behalf could be interpreted as intentional decisions. Now I'm not saying that's the case, but you certainly could look at it that way if you were so inclined. The gameplay in Assassin's Creed 1 has obviously aged a certain degree. It's not as smooth and polished as you'd be used to from later entries, but the general blueprint for the series control scheme, up until Syndicate anyway, is all here in this first game. You essentially puppet Altair with the face buttons on the controller, with A being used for the legs, Y for the head, and X and B for the arms respectively. While playing the game, you also have the choice to perform actions in low or high profiles. By default, you're in low profile, where everything you do is quiet and discreet, as you'd expect from an assassin. From here, you can gently push your way past civilians and pickpocket those you need to steal from. You can use eagle vision to separate allies, enemies, your targets, and the general public. You can subtly blend in with the crowd by walking alongside other people clad in white. This is how you initially sneak past a few guards to enter the cities for the first time. And last, but certainly not least, is the assassination. Whilst in low profile, Altair will quietly press his hidden blade up against his target and take them out without arousing suspicion. But when you pull the right trigger, you enter high profile mode, where everything you do is far more loud and abrasive. The gentle push is replaced by a charging tackle, the blend mechanic is replaced with a full on sprint, and the subtly delicate assassination becomes a far more brutal and aggressive manoeuvre. You can even perform an ear assassination, which a lot of people, including my younger self, thought was introduced in the sequel, but is actually possible in this first game, albeit a bit temperamental. If you lock onto your target, enter high profile, run to the edge of whatever you're leaping from, press X, and the wind is in the right direction, then you might actually pull this off. I practically never used it in my latest playthrough though, since it's so finicky and awkward to use. Most of the time you try it, you tend to just jump off of a building and land right in front of your target awkwardly. The profile system takes a little while to get used to initially, but it doesn't take too long to become hardwired into your system. It gives you a tremendous sense of control and flexibility in not only how you go about your missions, but also explore the world. You can quietly stalk the streets unnoticed, gently pushing passers-by out of the way, or you can take to the roofs and leap from building to building where you have a height advantage, but also will attract attention from nearby guards who will attack you for trespassing. It's easy to see why this system lasted so long in the series. It's inherently fun. One of the series' biggest innovations, not only for itself, but for the gaming medium, is the ability to free run. Similarly to the free flow mechanic in the Arkham series, the free running in Assassin's Creed is very easy to understand and perform, but looks and feels very satisfying to pull off. Whilst in high profile mode, simply hold A to sprint and run towards stuff. That's it. Altair will launch himself from buildings, perform leaps of faith, hop over any obstacles in his way, and scale his way up almost any wall he encounters. Now, the climbing specifically in this game tends to be on the receiving end of a lot of negative press. Common complaints are that it's too slow, too janky, and simply wasn't as fun or engaging as it was in the next game. There is an element of truth to this, I found that the clunky controls often caused me to accidentally do things that I didn't particularly want to, like leap to my death from 300 feet up. Honestly, I'd say that 80% of my deaths in this game were from awkward controls playing up while I was free running and then taking a tumble off of a high roof. That being said, I do have a personal fondness for the slow, methodical way that Altair climbs structures in this game. 
I understand that it's not the most entertaining way to get around, especially when compared to how quickly Ezio climbs in the sequels, but I honestly do appreciate how Altair takes his time when scaling the walls of a fortress. Each brick, each ledge is instrumental and plays a part in him eventually reaching the top. It feels a little more grounded, and where Ezio seems to be a superhero-esque action star that's capable of anything, Altair comes across as a highly skilled professional that doesn't fear death. The combat in this game is another point of contention since it is serviceable, but has been vastly improved in the series' later entries. While in open combat, you'll eventually have access to five different forms of attack. You can use your fists, but why would you? You can use a sword, which serves as a kind of jack of all trades. You have the short blade, which is quicker than the sword at the expense of raw damage. You can throw knives, which are finite but result in an instant kill from range. And finally, the hidden blade. The hidden blade is a risk reward weapon that leaves you vulnerable without the ability to block, and isn't capable of outright attacking but when used perfectly allows you to perform instant takedowns on your attackers. Towards the start of the game, after you've had your rank and weapon stripped from you, combat can be quite difficult. A lot of people claim that you can beat this game simply by mashing the attack button, but it's not quite as simple as they often make it out to be. For one, you sometimes have to repeatedly hit an enemy up to five or six times before you kill them, and two, Enemies will interrupt your attacks by hitting you themselves, or occasionally grabbing and throwing you to the floor. It's not difficult to attack, but it can be troublesome to defend yourself when overwhelmed. That is, until you unlock the counter abilities. Not even that far into the story, Altair unlocks the counter ability again, which allows you to parry an opponent's attack and retaliate with a finishing blow. From this point onwards, open combat is essentially holding the right trigger for high profile actions and pressing X whenever an enemy is about to strike you. This strategy will carry you to the end of the game without any real effort. It's kind of a shame really, I think the combat should always be difficult. Not because I'm a hardcore gamer, but for what is ultimately a narratively satisfying purpose. If open combat is hard, then you will be encouraged to employ stealth, which is an assassin's purpose. It's so easy to blitz through the game by ham-fistedly attacking guards and drawing far more attention to yourself than necessary. At the very beginning of the story, Altair breaks all three tenets of the Assassin's Creed, including hide in plain sight and never compromise the Brotherhood. Altair is supposed to go on a journey throughout the game where he matures and comes to terms with the brash, arrogant person he was before. But when you plow your way through the cities and kill your targets using the methods that Altair did at the start, it creates a ludonarrative dissonance that could have easily been avoided. It is significantly easier to just have a sword fight where you counter kill everybody and end the whole thing in a minute than it is to spend 15 minutes sneaking around and doing everything in the shadows. As someone that enjoys stealth gameplay and appreciates what the story here is trying to do, it just comes across as a missed opportunity. As you progress through the game, Altair slowly discovers that each of his nine targets aren't simply random public enemies, but are working together. They're all working for the Templars, and together they aim to end the Crusades and place the Holy Land under their control. Altair learns that the artifact that he was sent to retrieve at the start, which has since been recovered by the Assassins, was discovered by ten Templars, including the nine you've been sent to kill. The other one... Al Mualim. Altair's mentor is a former Templar who now has his hands on the artifact that he so desired and has sent you to kill everybody else who knows of its power so that he can selfishly keep it for himself. Upon returning to Masayaf and confronting Al Mualim, Altair discovers that the treasure called the Apple of Eden creates illusions and that his master's intention is to compel mankind into a brainwashed state and in doing so, bring in an end to all conflict. After a long-winded boss fight, we kill Al Mualim and recover the artifact. The apple activates and displays a holographic map of the world with numerous locations of other pieces of Eden marked across the globe. Desmond wakes up from the Animus to discover that Abstergo is a modern-day front for the Templars and that the information they were looking for in Altair's memory was the location of the other pieces of Eden. Due to a commotion outside the building, he learns that the modern day assassins had tried to rescue him before the memory had completed, but had failed and were mostly killed. 
After this incident, Desmond was to be killed himself after an order from a high-ranking Templar, but Lucy manages to save him. She signals to Desmond by tucking her ring finger into her palm, which is a reference to the assassin's tradition of cutting off their finger to make room for the hidden blade. From this, we can infer that Lucy is an undercover assassin, and that she was the one who left us the access code to learn about what was going on. After everybody leaves, Desmond finds himself trapped in the Abstergo laboratory, but his experience in the Animus has resulted in a bleeding effect of Altair's life and his own. Desmond discovers that he now has the ability to use Altair's eagle vision, and notices strange symbols and markings over the laboratory that were previously invisible. The messages all seem to deal with various forms of the end of the world from different cultures, including references to the 21st of December, 2012, the date that Abstergo plans to launch a satellite that will permanently end the war. Desmond asks himself who left these messages and where are they now? Cut to black. That's the cliffhanger that we were left on in 2007. Now, as fun as Assassin's Creed is for its depiction of the Third Crusade and its fun sci-fi shenanigans, it does have a real sense of thematic resonance that often gets overlooked, because it's that Ubisoft game that gets remade every year. This first game is ultimately a story about independence and following your own path. You don't have to do anything simply because someone tells you to. You can remain loyal to somebody without blindly following their every command like a good little soldier. Al-Mualim tells Altair to investigate and that he shouldn't expect everything to be handed to him, yet when he's approached for information, he states that Altair should stop asking questions and do as he's told. The man is a walking definition of a hypocrite and tells others whatever is convenient for him at that time. He's not a leader, he's a tyrant. The man you've been confiding in this whole time is a narcissistic monster. And when you think about it, the Templars that we thought were the real villains this whole time actually have a more grounded perspective of the world. I'm not saying that the Templars were actually the good guys the whole time, but when looked at next to Al-Mualim, their cause appears far more understandable. Here's the thing, you know that cliche of, you and I aren't so different? That does sort of ring true here. The Assassins and the Templars ultimately have the same goal, to end worldwide conflict and usher in a new era of peace and order. However, they both have contradicting views on how this should be accomplished. The Assassins fight for free will, the freedom of speech and equality for all, an optimistic, if naive, perspective on the scenario. The Templars, however, believe that peace can never truly be achieved so long as people have free will. Therefore, they seek to accomplish this through control and letting the quote-unquote right people have access to certain powers or education so that the whole world may benefit. They believe that the ends will justify the means. It makes you think that the world isn't contrasted into good people and bad people. It's all just contrasting points of view. Take a look at real world politics. People on all sides have done great things and terrible things. But you can't just separate left-wing and right-wing politics into heroes and villains. It's far more complicated than that. Granted, it doesn't delve into these thematics very deeply, but posing the initial question and starting the debate is a pretty good start. And that's it, so thank you all very much for watching this video, I do hope that you enjoyed it, if you did be sure to give it a like down below and subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of stuff, I might cover some more games in this series, I don't know. I'm going to try not to make promises because I keep saying I'll do stuff and then I get distracted and I don't do it, so I'm not making any commitments but I am interested so there is a possibility it may happen in future. I also recently uploaded a video where I ranked every movie that I watched over 2022 that came out in that year. It's like just under two hours long. It's a bit of a beast of a video. So if you're interested in that, then feel free to go watch that. Otherwise, I do have a lot of other gaming content over here. So be sure to check that out if it piques your interest. Well, that's all for now. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.